and Lord Richard Dunnett is uh, with us now, former Chief of the General Staff, of course. Um, hello to you, my Lord. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Uh, what's your interpretation of what's happening in Ukraine at the moment? Well, Kay, we are witnessing some uh, incredible scenes. Um, the Russians undoubtedly have suffered a significant setback, and the Ukrainians have been very clever in, in what they've been doing. If you remember, over the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about a possible counteroffensive in the south around the area of Kherson. And uh, everyone took that seriously. And indeed, there had been um, counteroffensive moves uh, in the south, but it was played up to be the big counteroffensive, such that the Russians deployed some of their better troops away from the north to counter this a potential counteroffensive in the south. But in fact, what the Ukrainians had in mind all along was actually this major attack, uh, not in the south, but actually in the north, in the Kharkiv area. And that's what they have unfolded dramatically and very successfully uh, in, the, in the last few days. I mean, they've pulled off an operational level surprise, um, quite a significant thing to be able to do. Um, the result of that is that the uh, Russians have pretty much turned and fled in that um, area of, of Ukraine. Um, Kupiansk, which was one of their major logistic hubs, has fallen. Many of the railway tracks um, bringing supplies in to the Russians uh, converge in that part of the world, and indeed the town of Izium as well. They've both fallen. Um, and this is a significant reverse for the Russians, a great success for the Ukrainians. And as President Zelensky is saying, um, they'll do more, but they continue to need more and more Western arms and ammunition in order to be able to keep the pressure up. But um, there's been no doubt that this is a significant uh, improvement in the circumstances. Great for the people that um, Deborah was just talking to. But um, if you just look at the map, um, although the Ukrainians have made significant advances, there's a lot of their country still in Russian occupation. Um, so there's a long way to go. Yeah, and as far as the blackouts are concerned that we've been hearing about, that can cause no end of problems, not only for civilians, but also for the military. Well, of course, you're right. But what we're seeing is the Russians reacting in their typically heavy-handed way. Um, they know that they've had a significant reverse on the battlefield. So they're lashing out uh, in other ways to, to try and restore their position. Um, and so the attack on the power station, which has reduced that part of uh, the Kharkiv area to darkness, uh, is a typical example of them blindly lashing out with everything they possibly can to try and reassert themselves. But but I think experience shows, looking right back through history, that if you're trying to win a war by cowing the opposition's public, it just doesn't work. Um, and the resistance and the attitude that you're seeing from the Ukrainian people is, yes, no, we don't like the darkness, we don't like the lack of water, but we will win through. Um, they will not break our spirit. Um, and I think that is the other critical issue. Morale in Ukraine, morale amongst the Ukrainian forces is sky high when amongst the Russian forces, it is terribly low. Um, and turning and running and fleeing, and base hospitals being overrun, being evacuated. I mean, this is these are signs of, well, I was going to say an army in panic, certainly an army in disarray. And Putin and his senior generals have got a real problem to know how to stabilise the area um, in the north. They'll do it because their numbers are such that they will. But um, there's no getting away from the fact They've suffered a major reverse at the present moment. Uh, but Putin is, I suppose, uh, potentially it is most dangerous when he is cornered, and thus the same for his army. Uh, you're right, and I think you're probably suggesting um, the question of will he up the ante, um, possibly even in a nuclear way. Well, I would like to fervently hope that he will not do that. I think he has other options. Um, he's always called this a special military operation and has tried to use <clears throat> in-place forces. He has got the option, if he thinks politically he could get away with it, by declaring war with the change to regulations and change to law in uh, Russia that that would bring, whereby he could bring in conscription, he could start to mobilise other parts of the Russian military to try and stabilise the front. But... Um, there's great political risks in him doing that. So far, he's managed to contain what the Russian people know about this appalling uh, operation that he began. Um, but if he goes down the, down the track of calling it a war, uh, fully mobilising his country, bringing in conscription, then the political stakes for him become increasingly high, and maybe he won't do that. 
President Zelensky has said the next three months are critical as we head into the winter time. Would you agree with him? Uh, yes, I think actually every day is critical, every week is critical at the present moment. Um, the period of manoeuvre can continue during what's an increasingly wet period uh, on the ground. <clears throat> and then as we get closer to the end of the year, uh, the temperatures will drop, the ground will freeze, um, and that will make conditions very difficult. But it does actually mean that degree of movement can start again. But um, I think those circumstances are such that I would expect to see continuing movement now, and then probably the war going into a, a fairly period of stasis uh, over the worst of the winter. And then we'll see what happens again uh, next spring. Because the Russians have been trying to <clears throat> amass a larger force. <clears throat> They've been putting together something called the Third Army Corps, uh, which is a force that they're trying to recruit and train and we're hoping to put back into the field next spring. Because of the pressure on them, they've had to put some of those units already into the field, probably only partially trained. So the thing is spiraling out of Putin's control. Um, as I say, I think we'll see more movement in the next few weeks, probably slowing down during the heart of the winter, and then maybe the denouement next spring. Before I let you go, um, my lord, a thought on the passing of the Queen. What impact does it have uh, on the military when there is uh, a new sovereign? Well, it has the impact on all of us in the country, but I think it has a particular impact on members of the armed forces. Um, much has been made of the fact that when we join the Army, Navy, Air Force or whatever, um, we, sign, we, we swear an oath of allegiance. And I did that on the 28th of August, 1969, a long time ago now. And that oath of allegiance was to Queen Elizabeth II. But actually, the uh, phrase also, her heirs and successors were part of that oath. So seamlessly, when the Queen breathed her last, last Thursday, our allegiance as soldiers of the Queen, we immediately became soldiers of the King. And that's a very special link that the military have. We carry out operations at risk of life and limb, not in the name of the government or the Prime Minister or the Secretary of State for Defence. We do it in the name of the Sovereign and the people of this country. That's a very special link, a very special bond. Actually, I think it makes the British Armed Forces themselves pretty special as a result. Indeed so, my Lord. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the programme this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Kate.